Hampton University has one of the best departments of architecture in the region. It is housed within the School of Engineering and Technology. Today, we'll meet Robert Easter, chair of the department, along with faculty and students who've helped the department garner its stellar reputation. I'm your host, Joseph Walters, and you're watching The View from Hampton U. Hi, my name is Robert Easter. I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture here at Hampton University. Well, prior to coming to Hampton, I was in private practice. I had and have my own firm, Council on Easter, which is in Richmond, Virginia. And I had been in practice for 26 years prior to coming to Hampton. The firm is 31 years old. I came to Hampton because as an alum of this program, I feel very close and committed to uh, its continuance and, and its excellence. And when the previous chair left the program, he was a good friend of mine and we had some discussions about uh, what was going on in the program and I wanted to make sure that that level of excellence continued. I went to Hampton two years ago, back in the 70s. Mr. John Spencer was the chair of the program at that time. I had a lot of fun, made a lot of friends, and the program was pretty much geared towards preparing us for professional practice. And after uh, leaving Hampton, I went to Virginia Tech where I got my master's degree in architecture and urban design. Spent four years in the military and then went into private practice. It's not difficult to make connections with our students. We have a very close-knit program. We've got, in addition to myself, eight very highly competent and dedicated uh, faculty members. We have kind of a family atmosphere here in this program. We've got 150 to 180, depending on the day of the week. Very strong, stellar students who have a lot of commitment to architecture, and it's really not difficult being connected to them. I'm usually here in the building till 9 or 10 o'clock most evenings. I'm strolling around because students are usually in the building doing their work. It's not hard to be connected to them. As it was many years ago, our focus is preparing students for professional practice as architects, preparing them for licensure, preparing them to meet the challenges of both our profession and the built environment. The program has maintained its level. We, didn't ha we don't have much room to grow right now, but it has grown in terms of the quality of work that's coming out of our program, in terms of our, our connections with the professionals in and around this area, regionally and nationally, who continue to come and pursue our students and come to share with our students their experiences as professionals. Architecture is a creative field that shapes the built environment. And if you look at other areas of practice, whether it be music, athletics, those things that require creativity, we have shown that we excel at. And when our level of creativity is added to the built environment, it enhances the built environment. When I was with Noma, at the early stages, we could document less than 500 registered African American architects in the United States. Today, we have documented approximately 1,800 African American architects registered to practice. Of over 120,000 architects, those numbers are abysmal. So, NOMA's responsibility, Hampton's responsibility, is to improve those numbers because when we improve the numbers, we improve the level of creativity brought to bear on our environment. We're working on a, a number of projects. Some of the more exciting projects include the 2013 Solar Decathlon sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy. This is a project that Professor David Perrine is working on with a group of students to build a solar energy house. Hi, my name is David Perrine assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at Hampton University. The Solar Decathlon is an international architecture and engineering contest that has 20 teams from international schools, some from Europe, some from Canada, in the past China, so many different continents. Competing against the teams from all over the world is a very collegiate experience for the students and faculty knowing that 20 different universities and teams of universities, so there may be actually 
more than 20 schools, like we team with ODU, creates this atmosphere of an exciting time for the students knowing that they're going to become the next generation of designers uh, and engineers to promote a sustainable living. Being in that collegiate environment helps make it feel like you're a big group for one purpose. So even though it's a competition, you're all competing for a, a grander scheme of a better world. This year's design includes some major different engineering uh, systems. We are using a special hot water device called Sun Drum, which extracts the heat from the photovoltaic panels. So it, in, in, in effect, it's like a radiator for the photovoltaic panels. So it makes the photovoltaic panels work a lot more efficiently and extracts that heat and it becomes a system that makes the hot water. And there's some other components into that hot water system uh, that include a phase change material, which is like wax that melts at certain degree points, which will keep the water hotter for longer. Architecturally, one major purpose of our house is to make these advanced technologies much more accessible to a diverse population of people, which we've also extended to become a representation of universal design and technology, which helps somebody understand how to operate a house that's uh, very technically advanced. The form of the house, the way the house works, uh, is also extends the idea of universal design so that somebody could have this home as a young person and uh, be able to grow old in that house without worry or if you have some difficulty or some impairment or if you say break your leg or some other type of um, unfortunate event you can still access the technology and access all of the uh, features of the house so that's the principle of universal design that we call aging in place. To be a successful architecture student one thing that's absolutely critical is time management and to be able to organize when you can do the large amount of outside class work as well as maintain a personal life. To be a good student, you both need to work hard and to understand the world you live in. It's necessary for you to find life outside of the classroom. You're gonna always be challenged by the amount of work that's required. So. Finding a system that works for you to give yourself the ability to do both is very important. One other part of becoming a successful architecture student is to always have a sense of wonder and curiosity, uh, to be able to look for solutions that don't have to be completely wild, but they can be simple but wonderful. That's very important to be able to reduce your idea of what could be great to something that can be doable, but yet done well. Knowing graphic design uh, before I got into architecture helped me to formalize a design process. So as I teach, I teach through visualization techniques of how they should formulate their idea, and that would be visualized to the somebody who didn't understand it. So graphic design, uh, just the process of presenting something visually so that somebody understands it is how I introduce uh, different ways of representation of the particular projects they're working on. There's more from the Department of Architecture when we return. The View from Hampton Hughes, bringing you in-depth interviews Cutting edge research, amazing sports highlights, faculty and student profiles, and much more. I'm Stephanie Sutton. And I'm Joseph Walters. And, and you're, you're watching, watching The View from Hampton U. And now, more from the Department of Architecture. Hi, my name is Carlton Copeland. I'm a fourth year architecture major, and I'm also the project manager for the Soldier Cathlon 2013 competition. This year, um, we actually come, came up with and designed what we call the Canopy House. 
and its original inspiration is actually from nature's own forest canopy. And we took that and we kind of ran with it and said, where can we go in, in terms of design and in terms of engineering and architecture, where can we take that? And if you think about nature's own canopy and forest, the different type of inhabitants and species that it actually contains, there's a different multitude of people that are out there. So then we started developing on that and we designed around the principles of universal design, which is simply design for all. And that led us into the concepts of aging in place, which is simply designing an environment that actually adapts to the user's needs and being able to, for that person, you know, regardless of any type of impairment, physical ability, that they're actually able to work and live independently in that environment that we created. In a nutshell, that's basically our concepts. And two main features that um, the Canopy House actually utilizes in our design, we have, it's called a DM wall, which is Data Integrated Engineering and Mechanics, and it's this huge wall that you can see from the exterior of the house, it runs from north and south, and what we're actually creating with that is, if you think about a tree, and you think about its trunk, what are the functions of that trunk? Without that trunk, a tree cannot actually survive. Without our DM wall, the canopy house cannot survive. It houses all of our plumbing systems and electrical systems. For our Huey system in the canopy house, it's definitely something that's gonna reach us to the top five of the competition. And so what the Huey system actually does, it's an integrative system that the user will actually be able to interact with to be able to check the energy savings of the competition. And in addition, it's even able to control the lights in the house. This year, Team Tidewater actually branched out further than the architectural department. We actually were able to recruit students from Scripps Howard Communications Journalism and also from Hampton University's engineering department. And so as project manager, being able to manage all of these different teams have been great because we've been able to expand the project a lot further. And so, for instance, with the Scripps communication team, you know, they have been dedicated to actually coming up with some media ideas. They're always on site with cameras, so that's been great for Team Tidewater. Team Tidewater has put so much dedication and effort in trying to design and build the Canopy House. The biggest thing that we're waiting for right now is actually just getting to sunny California and being out there and being able to socialize with everyone, so can't wait for that. The second project would be the Minfield House Community Gardens that uh, Runa Okioma is working with a group of students to develop. Hello, I'm Runa Okioma. I'm an assistant professor here at Hampton University and I teach architecture. I actually teach three courses. Uh, my first course is sustainable design, so that's archaecology. I also teach two design studios and a fourth course which is called innovation and design. So I'll, I'll say I started off um, undergraduate, University of Texas at Arlington. They have an architecture program and I ended up doing architecture because I'm originally from Nigeria and I remember being born in the U.S., being raised in Nigeria, constantly thinking I would like to re redesign my environment, at least in Nigeria, because of my experiences in the U.S. growing up. So coming into UT Arlington, I focused on architecture primarily, like I said, to, to, to understand how to build my community when I, whenever I returned to Nigeria. But once I arrived at UT Arlington, I ended up understanding about sustainable design. So it wasn't just aesthetically pleasing design, but it was design that was actually economically and socially sustainable. I, you know, like I said, I teach sustainable um, sustainability, which is called our architecture ecology. So that course also feeds in because they're, they're the younger students, second year. So they're just sort of wetting their feet about, oh, so I I don't have to just be another designer building for the super wealthy. I can design that's in a way that's responsible to the environment, in a way that's responsible to my community, which is the social aspects, in a way that is economically feasible, right? So there's a, there's a lot of other facets that come in as opposed to, as in several other design institutions, it's just about aesthetics, right? There's a lot of archi jargon, people talking about things that have nothing to do, no, no impact to our real environment or the masses. They just really want to design sort of selfishly for themselves, but here that's not the case. And I see a growing movement, not just about fa with faculty, but with the students, about saying we want to design better, not just for ourselves, but for the next generation responsibly. So this class has doesn't just talk about it, but we actually pull it off. And and what's brilliant about it is we've been able to pull it off in a in a very rare format, whereby the big question, which I'm sure you're thinking, is how can designers, architects who have a, who are very rather expensive, how can they do projects for people at the bottom of the pyramid or communities in need? In our in this case, we have Mentual House, which is a transitional housing facility for young families, mothers and children, how can we do design for them and who is, who is gonna pay? How can designers work for, or, or sustainably work at that level? And the truth is, designers have to be not to be more than just designers, and that's what this class is about. And as the students come in, you'll get to see that it's, it's not just designers, it's designers as advocates. So we not only 
desire to work with these communities. We advocate that what the community wants and sees and says is in our process, the input from the residents comes in to the fore front and center of what we do. And then also, we also find the funds. So we are the intermediaries. We look for the grants, right? So there's a grant writing component. There is writing competitions, trying to find funds, these kinds of opportunities, more PR. We do that. We're, as designers, we love to talk about what we do. So with these kind of avenues, we'll bring funds in to help the communities that we wish to help with good design that's economically feasible, that's environmentally friendly, that's aesthetically pleasing, and um, that is addressing their social problem. And so that's how we ended up with, with Mentorful House as a, as, a, as a partner. And so I, I typically just had a mandate to just go into the community. It was actually here in Newport News, talking with people in um, transitional housing facilities and saying, is there some, would you like to come, can we just talk with you and find out what are your issues and, and challenges and how can we help? The, the director at Mentual House, she opened her doors and, and she really walked our students through what it's like to, 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 to be without a home and to have to need a facility like this. And she explained how several people, even people with graduate degrees, get to a place where sometimes they need to be in a transitional housing situation. And how do you make that environment all, much more than just temporary lodging, if you will. So, so she really gave us that introduction and then we had the opportunity through her, her generosity to work with the, with the residents and the women and, and their children even, to ask them, what do you think? And, and as you start seeing the design unfold, you, you, you can start seeing literally where some of the color directives that we got directly from the mothers saying this has to, you know, this should be there and this should be there. We take all that into consideration and we've come two years now in the, in the process, although last year it was more of looking into into homeless shelters this year we focus specifically on transitional housing with our, our umbrella of partners and and we've made we've made quite a bit of progress and we look forward to building the prototype to really showcase that this can be done and then hopefully raising the funds to build the entire thing at Mentual House to really add value to the lives of the mothers there the view from Hampton U will return in a moment When I found out that I had prostate cancer, I thought it was the end of the world. My wife broke down and cried. The Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute is treating prostate, breast, lung, pediatric, brain, and other cancers with the most precise form of radiation treatment available. Proton therapy made it a wonderful life. It really did. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, call the Proton Therapy Institute at 877-251-6838. Great day to be alive. And now, more from The View from Hampton U. My name is Roberta McLaughlin, and I'm a graduate architecture student from Brooklyn, New York. My name is Tauta Dawadu, and I'm a fourth-year architecture student from Campinas, Brazil. The Nature Nurture Project is an innovative vertical gardening system that facilitates a healthy eating and lifestyle for the resident families of menstrual health industries in Newport News, Virginia. So it's a multidisciplinary project. It involves sustainability, affordability, community planning, and flexibility. So we started off with the actual owner of Mentoral House Ministries, Ms. Sylvia Jones, and we tried to get input as far as what they wanted in this vertical gardening system, what plants they wanted to grow, what kind of vegetables, all that kind of information. So we got information from the residents as well as Ms. Sylvia Jones. So it's a project which is highly specialized. So the first thing you have to do is to reach out to other people that have worked with gardens before. Reach out to Hampton Girls, and they support us a lot with the design and making that a system that works. Another partner that we have been working close to is the Marine Science Department here on campus, and they basically made it possible for us to build prototypes. We apply for a grant, and we got a grant. So it's and um, we started off with five hundred dollars and that amount raised up to a thousand so now you can build more and you can even build a real uh, size prototype and take it back to Mentorville so that's a pretty cool thing we're really excited we'll start building probably next week so that's we're finalizing construction documents getting the materials going to Home Depot every week <laughs> and that's pretty cool and the other struggle we've been through this project as well was to build affordably because once when you're designing first year, second year, third year, you don't think about each single piece that goes into your design and how how much each single piece costs, even a nail has a price. So for this project it was very important for us to start design from the beginning, thinking about how much we'll would cost how affordable we would be and how easy it is to put together. Being that I am graduating, I'm looking at this more as 
how it can benefit me after I graduate. So at the end of this school year, during the summertime, planning on building the actual, pro well, actual building the whole system in the summertime. So grants are being looked into as far as the money that can help build this whole system. I'm going to be working in New York, but I do plan on coming in and trying to chip in and watch the construction of this whole thing. Being in New York, I would like to get more of a kind of social input now in designing socially. Who I work for now, we do a lot of historically rest or restoration projects and preservation projects. So I guess you can say that it is kind of a social designing, but more designing for community, I think I would start looking more into doing designs, so designs like that. I'll be here for another year, and during this, this next year to come, we'll be seeking a $10,000 grant to actually build a model that can be used at Manchville House. I hope that this class can be an example to all the other students, first year, second years, there who have the opportunity to do things similar to this. Because as you guys can see, there's a lot of things that we architecture students can do for our communities. My involvement in ministry has always been community oriented. I spent 15 years in prison ministry, 12 years in pastoral ministry. It's been my opportunity to serve community. How that translates into what we do as a program. Our students through the student organizations, the American Institute of Architects Students Group and the National Organization of Minority Students Group, which is a combined professional organization here in Bemis, affords our students opportunities to do a lot of community events and activities. Our students have been involved with a number of other community related activities that help them go out and serve the community, help them go out and be involved in community service. The architect advances that are occurring in our profession now focus primarily on sustainability. Our program has a significant effort in teaching students issues of sustainability in design and construction, which is one of the reasons that we're involved in Solar Decathlon. But our students are taught how to integrate sustainable and environmentally sensitive design components into the design of their projects so that they are able to meet the challenges that we're about to face with uh, energy consumption, with climate change, with that rising seas and storm issues. So there are a lot of things that happen in the environment that affect the way buildings are going to be designed in the future and our students are being prepared for that challenge. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to log on to theviewfrom.hamptonu.edu to watch previous episodes, or you can give us a call, 757-727-5960, to give us your feedback on the show. Join us next week when Dr. Wayne Harris, Dean of the School of Pharmacy, offers a tour of the school. We'll see you then. Proton therapy was much easier than what I was expecting. I thought surely I would have some side effects. The Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute is treating prostate, breast, lung, pediatric, brain, and other cancers with the most precise form of radiation treatment available. And I had no side effects whatsoever. So it was the best decision I ever made. <laughs> if you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, call the Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute today. Join us next week for another exciting episode of The View from Hampton Youth.